What's up, guys? Welcome to the Mastery Podcast. I am delighted um, to be joined by none other than the OG of YouTube, <laughs> Mike Thurston. Um, I said to you guys right away that um, I'll be bringing lots of different guests on over back end of this year and into next year. And after a really inspiring and exciting journey to uh, Dubai, I bumped into Mike when we got to Benus and we hadn't arranged this, um, the gym over in Dubai. And uh, we uh, decided to do a YouTube video and this has turned into obviously doing a, a separate podcast. So Mike, welcome to the Mastery Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. No, we, um, it must have been four, four years ago, we, we got together in London and uh, had you know, a few different meetings and conversations about uh, business and life and um, you know, direction. Yeah. I, was, I was definitely at a point where I felt a little bit lost. Like I'd, I'd created a decent business myself. I'd built my social media platforms, but then I was just thinking like, okay, well, what direction am I going? And I felt extremely lost. I felt like I was just making content for the sake of content. And that's when I realized, you know what, I need some help. I need some guidance. And obviously, I'd been following you for quite some time, along with a few other fitness professionals. But all the stuff you were putting out, I believed it related to me a lot. And I could definitely benefit from just sitting down with you. So, um, yeah, I reached out. And um, you, you literally we had a lot of interesting conversations and you pointed me down the right direction. I think that one of the biggest things that stood out to me was uh, when you were asking, you know, what is my purpose? And that really made me think because I had no, I'd never really thought about that before. And once we'd clarified kind of what that was, then I was like, okay, I know which direction to head in and I know what sort of content I should be putting out there. And very often, you know, we'll delve into this deeper as we get into the, to the episode today. But uh, very often it could be, it can just be a directional shift for somebody who is entrepreneurial, who does have a lot of skills inside them, but just need, need them unlocking. So, you know, I don't want this episode to be kind of um, the depths of what we went into and, 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 and what degree I supported you. But I, you know, it was great from that opportunity to get together. Um, your career is by no means attributed to, to the time that we spent together. But at the same time, I will say this. Guys, for those of you who don't know Mike, uh, Mike at the moment has 1.2 million YouTube followers uh, and growing um, and will soon have a million followers on Instagram, which <laughs> is growing very, very fast. Um, Mike is a, a my protein athlete. We'll drop that in um, uh as well um but he's also an entrepreneur um he's also an entrepreneur got various different businesses which i'm going to get mike to just delve into in a second but guys mike is actually also a coach and there's a lot of you know youtubers and you know fitness celebrities out there who have not actually established themselves as coaches and one of the reasons why I, when i was in dubai i enjoyed training with mike because mike really is fascinated by his training and the and, and his you know style of training and has spent a lot of time investing and learning over the years and you know that's you know a, a real unique quality of mike but could you just give everybody mike um and a kind of overview as to you what you do now and also how long you've been doing what you've been doing to give some trainers some perspective of the journey so far to where you are right so it's quite a long story, but I think I started off as a personal trainer when I was 22. So I'm 31 now. So 22 years old, I started personal training clients out of uh, a gym in Newcastle. Obviously, it was a slow start. I wasn't charging much at all. I think I was only charging like 20 pound an hour. Sometimes I was just giving away free sessions. Over the course of a couple of months, I built up my confidence my experience and I'd managed to get my name out there. Word of mouth was one of the best ways for me to get business when I was in Newcastle. Then after six months, I teamed up with one of my friends who was also a personal trainer and we decided we needed to open our own studio because the place we were training at was just, it was a great place, um, but it was a little rough around the edges and it wasn't necessarily a place where the higher end clients would like to train at. So we, we invested quite a, money, quite a bit of money, which we saved up and we opened up a studio and the, uh, we joined forces and created a company called Aurora Athletic. So that was a very interesting experience in itself, having my own studio at the age of 23, which was, you know, that, at that point, I was like, I was pretty impressed with 
the fact that I'd had that at quite an early age. And during that time period, literally all I was doing was training clients, like all day, every day. I think I probably had about one day off a week on a Sunday. But apart from that, I was training clients, perfecting my craft, and that was obviously my main source of income. Now, whilst I was training people, I was working on my social media as well, not necessarily YouTube, because at that point I had, well, I, I simply just wasn't confident enough to be on camera. I was just kind of doing my Instagram. So my Instagram was steadily growing. And as social media became more popular, it actually became possible to monetize that and start I started at that point online coaching I did a little bit of online coaching but I couldn't do too much of both because the once one personal training was taking up the majority of my time and energy so I did a little bit of online coaching on the side now I think it was 26 years old this was after three years of coaching clients thousands of hours of experience under the belt I felt like you know what I could actually start talking about this and I noticed you know, I'd watched a bit of YouTube videos back in the day, but I, I looked at other coaches and what other people were putting out. And I, I thought to myself, there's no reason why I can't do the same thing. Um, the only problem was I'd had uh, an issue speaking in front of the camera. Like, I, was, I don't know what it was, but every time I'd speak, whether it be an interview or just speak to a camera directly, I'd just fumble my words. There was no confidence. There was no assertiveness. It was just a bit of a mess. So at that point, I realized, well, if YouTube is something which I want to go down, and if I want to progress with my career, this is one aspect of myself which I need to improve upon. So I literally, would, I bought a camera, I put it on top of a tripod, and I used to speak to it every day. Uh, I would talk about things which I knew because when I knew about it, naturally it came across being more confident. So I would, I taught myself how to edit videos. And I think to begin with, I didn't really know what kind of content I was going to put out there because a lot of other YouTubers were doing vlogs. And I thought that, oh, maybe I have to like vlog and, you know, try and be entertaining to try and gain an audience. But I experimented doing a few different things. And I started the series called The Most Common Mistakes People Make uh, When Training Shoulders or When Training Chest. I went through each muscle group. 2.7 million views. Yeah. Was, stat man. It, I'm the stat man. <laughs> it was one of those videos it was the shoulder one yeah yeah that's the, the one where you're like this I, yeah. I i looked i did the research on your youtube your first one now sits at 2.7 million views five years ago yeah that's nuts yeah and it was it was that video it skyrocketed up to 100,000 views and i thought okay this is this is what people want to see yeah, yeah, yeah so from that point on i started creating content which was mostly educational and i think because I had so much experience training co uh, clients, I had this ability to break down complex topics and just simplify it to people. Mm. So I would speak to the camera like I was speaking to one of my clients. And I think this came across on video. So at this point, was I this, realized, Mike, Can I just ask you, was this all consciously done? Now, this is a very important point for a lot of people. You recorded these videos. You were very conscious that people were vlogging, but decided that you thought exercises was better. You decided that there was a topic that you thought was better. Was this intuition or were you learning it from someone? I think partly it was just observing the feedback. So noticing that these types of videos were getting more views. They were getting more likes, more comments. I've noticed people would message me on Instagram and say, hey, I really liked the recent video. And I think naturally for me, it, it was just easier to do. Like, I felt like this was my lane. Like, when I was trying to do vlogs and, like, try and entertain people, I find... Be a character, be a false question. character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think I'm naturally more of an introvert person. I like to spend quite a lot of my, my time by myself. I'm not usually, like, super extroverted, where, you know, I would uh, walk around, be the centre of attention, and... You know, sometimes if, if you do want to be that type of YouTuber, you have to have that personality where you're literally ready to pick up a camera, go out there and just like, you know, entertain people. Yeah, or like yeah, yeah. Loads of people into the video. I always felt like even though I'd become better at cam on camera, I still felt like that wasn't really my type of personality. So, yeah, I, I naturally felt more comfortable doing the educational stuff uh, instead of 
you know the 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 vlogging do you think that's an important thing for anybody that's doing youtube to identify to be themselves yeah 100 percent. because if you try sometimes to do what other people are doing and it's just naturally not who you are not only is it going to feel like real hard work but you just won't really come across as being yourself mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most important things. You know, if you're going to do YouTube, you have to be, you have to be yourself. You have to be authentic. You can't try and be someone that you're not, because mm -hmm. eventually it will just, it will show. Yeah, no, I think that's massively important. And it, you know, we'll get into kind of like the growth of the YouTube channel because obviously, just to, to allow you to finish, actually, that start five years ago for you and identifying that you wanted to talk about mistakes and wanted to talk about exercise. Um, that was the start of really the, the growth of the channel, right? Yeah. So at this point, I, I realized, okay, how much time do I have in my day? And what is really working for me? The problem I noticed when I was in Newcastle, uh, I, I was struggling to find clients that were willing to pay more because it's not necessarily the most affluent area, area in the UK. I did actually find that there were people traveling from you know, the rest of the UK and actually overseas to come to my studio and train. Uh, but I thought, you know what, it, it's a lot more satisfying for me to go out there and create a video which is going to help hundreds of thousands of people instead of just train one person and spend one to two hours with them. Mm -hmm. So I'd noticed I got more satisfaction from creating the videos. But I also like the idea that the videos, I had more freedom. Like I, I didn't necessarily have to be at the gym at a certain time to train a client because a client maybe you can only train at certain times of the day. When it comes to making my videos, I could work completely on my own time. And if I wanted to take it like three, four days off, I could do that. If I wanted to work like two days, two weeks straight, then I could do that as well. So I think it came to the point where I was like, right, so what am I going to choose? Am I going to try and juggle both? Well, no, I don't think that's really going to be a winning formula. Do I want to do the, the personal training and continue that full time? Not really, because I kind of lost the love for that a little bit. And I really, you know, after spending years and years in that studio, I felt like I had a bit of cabin fever. I wanted to travel. I wanted to mm -hmm. see the world. So I saw this uh, social media and creating YouTube videos as a way to allow me to actually still earn money, but have complete freedom to actually travel. And, you know, all I ever needed would be a camera and a laptop to edit my videos. Yeah. So that was at that point I made the decision, right, okay, it's time for me to leave Newcastle. Uh, it's time for me to leave my studio behind, to leave my clients. And it's time for me to go to London and pursue the social media uh, full time. So it, it was obviously it was a risk because I had a nice, comfortable life in Newcastle. But I saw a lot of potential within myself and I had uh, a lot of self-belief. The biggest risk was obviously I, I was stepping away from a, a decent source of income. Because at the time, the, the personal training cash which I was getting was a large chunk of my income. Mm. But I knew there was potential to make more from doing the social media thing. So I'd managed to get an apartment in London, which was three times as much as the rent in Newcastle. And I think the only form of income I had at that point in time, because my views weren't that crazy, so the monetization from YouTube was very very low. I think I had a sponsorship with EHP Labs, which was a thousand dollars a month. So I went to London. And I was like, right, I have to make it. There is, there's, there's no way I can fail in this situation. The thought of not being able to pay rent and then having to run back home and you know go back to my family, like uh, it just simply wasn't an option. So I was like, I need to graft. So I believe it was the year 2017 where I was like, right, I need to make the YouTube thing work. I want to kick off my online coaching. And anything else that comes with that is is great. So I, I think I look back at that year and it wasn't a particularly exciting year because it was just me. There was no cameraman. There was no editor. I was filming all my videos. I was editing all my videos. And I remember, I was, I remember you telling me that sitting at your laptop. I, I, was, was, I was pumping out like two, three videos a week. And I think I went from maybe like 5,000 subscribers to 300,000 subscribers within a year. And obviously... All of the, uh, the reach that I was getting from my videos, it was directing a lot of people to my website because of the content which I was putting out there. People were like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, I want to work with this guy. So 
my with the sales from my online coaching uh, was absolutely skyrocketing. So I ended up within that year, uh, oh, I probably like quadrupled, if not five times, my income. So it was it from was coaching online, lot. yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, you get the other added bonuses with you know if your channel is getting uh, a big reach then you start getting brands wanting to reach out and do collaborations with you you also get let's say for example with ehp labs you know i, I was beyond that you know i was worth more than a thousand dollars a month so i switched over to bulk powders and then they ended up like i think they, they were quadrupling what i was getting from the hp labs yeah yeah, yeah. so everything was on the rise the only downside was uh, i didn't really have much of a social life because that, that, that year i was just completely focused on focusing on my career i think that's that's roughly where we were speaking wasn't it i think i think yeah. around that time can i jump jump in and just look at something which i think will be really valuable for everybody listening i remember one of my mentors teaching me this the quality of your life depends on the quality of the questions that you ask yourself because if you don't ask any questions of yourself, you've got nothing to actually change because you just stay the same. Before you moved to London, you were questioning whether or not you wanted to be in a studio. You were questioning whether or not you wanted to work hours as a PT. You were questioning what it may be like to have a bit of more freedom. These big questions I always say to people are, are really important to listen to because you were listening to them and you were saying, no. I don't want to be in a busy gym. And what this was actually doing and something we sat down and discussed, everything that you value highly is the thing that you're most inspired to do. And you were losing inspiration of the things that you were doing because you didn't value them as much as you did do when you were PTing. Because I, like you, I love like being in a gym and training. And I said to you when we were in Dubai, you know, if I couldn't live the life that I have and live the values that I, that I, that I have, you know, I still love coaching but your value shifted the, the personal training, the gym ownership shifted. And I think this is a big important point for people to understand that you listen to the questions that you're asking of yourself, which were actually a shift in your values. You wanted freedom. You wanted to be around more people. Now here's the other thing. You put yourself in a very uncomfortable position. Do you think that more people would find it valuable for themselves to put them in an uncomfortable situation like you did in, in London, which was a do or die situation? Yeah. I mean, when you're in a, a situation like that, you really see what you're made of. Yeah, yeah. And you will, you will work like you've never worked before. Mm -hmm. Like it's crazy. And that's the problem because I always want to have that work ethic. Yeah. But it's very difficult because like now I've, I've come to Dubai, I have this like very, very comfortable life. And I keep trying to like put myself in these uncertain you know scary situations because i know that's what will elevate me and i i get the very best out of myself yeah so uh, it's definitely that's 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 when you see the most change when, when you're desperate when you're like oh like you, you have bills to pay you got overheads and you're like i need to pay these there's a really interesting concept which is um constantly redesigning the future and when you redesign it aligned with what you want it to look like it does so long as you can feel it so long as you can feel it's a positive move you've got to move towards it and like you move towards london but the funny thing is i think when you got to london and correct me if i'm wrong london felt right london felt amazing but when we sat down and discussed london suddenly stopped feeling right yeah and that's crazy because i lived in newark which is a small market town I then said it doesn't feel right, and I moved to Nottingham. doesn't feel right. I then moved to London, Central. That felt great. Then we're ready for a move. And it's, I think, entrepreneurially, I think it's a trait. In fact, I know it's a trait of, the, of entrepreneurs is that they'll go where the wind blows. Yeah. And at that time when you were in London, what was it that kind of started to give you the itchy feet that even though you were very, very busy, you thought, nah, something else is out there? Yeah, I think, I think it was... A, Definitely the, the, the lifestyle. I mean, I love London. I really do. But yeah. the, the biggest thing that put me off it was the weather. And I know, like, I'm, I'm the type of guy, I like to be outdoors. I like to see clear skies. I like to, you know, be by the beach, go to the pool. And I knew that London's a place that can't offer that. And when I was in 2000, it was 2019, I did a lot of traveling. 
because um, you know that was, that was when I really got into lifestyle and vlogging. So traveling allowed me to make my content more interesting, and I just wanted to see the world. Mm -hmm. And I got a feel for you know living in so many different places. And when I came back to London, I just realized, nah, that London isn't the place for me. There's there's somewhere else which I wanted to go. And Dubai was one of the places which I traveled to, and it was something I remember the first time I came, I went to Dubai, like. I will never forget that feeling. I was just, I was extremely inspired. You know, I think it was actually 2018, the first time I went there. I'd, I'd never been anywhere like it before. And I, it's, I find it very hard to explain, but from that first visit, I'd, it was on my the number one list of places to go to. Mm. But it's, it's, it's funny, you should, you should say that about like London and like Newcastle. What I always do is, I think like a year ahead. Yeah, yeah, you can tell. You can tell. So it's I clear. think I'm like I do not want to live the same year twice. So if I'd stayed in Newcastle, I knew that I was pretty much just going to repeat the year which I'd had, mm -hmm. and I didn't want that. Like that, like scares the shit out of me. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm not doing that. I want. I'll, let me go to London. I'll have a completely different experience. And. Obviously, I went there. It was great. But then after three years in London, I asked myself the same question. I was like, so what's going to happen in the next year? And I kind of you know, played it all out in my head. And I was like, realistically, a few things might happen, but I'm just going to replay the year I've just had. So I'm like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Like, I, I, let's, let's do something else. Learning, so a hell, learning a hell of a lot from this, Mike, because I think that um, stagnation uh, for a lot of people delivers frustration. And we know in psychology that frustration is a feedback mechanism to remind you that you're destined for more. Frustration is a feedback mechanism to remind you that there's a challenge out there that you're supposed to be going for or, or, or looking for. And I think with you, yep, I don't feel as fulfilled or unfulfillment and frustration. And it doesn't mean that you're unhappy. I think by, by any stretch of the imagination, you were, London's a great place to be, like you were finding, but there was more, there was more that you felt was out there. And I think something that is a really interesting point here is that you've identified you love beaches, you love the weather, you love traveling. And I said this to you when we met, it was like, not enough people are listening to what it actually, what they're telling themselves, because I'm sure you agree with me. Not everybody wants to be on a beach. I mean, somebody said to me the other day, they find Dubai quite heartless. And I went, well, for you. Yeah. But yeah. For, but for, I'll be honest, Marsh and I came back. Obviously, we saw you last couple of weeks ago. And Marsh and I were like, we're spending a lot more time there. Yeah. And most people, some people come back, and didn't like it. Yeah. Like, but, people would ask me that so many times. Like, what, what do you think of Dubai? Like, I'm thinking of moving there. And I'm like... You have to come here and feel it out for yourself because it's definitely not for everyone. If you're the type of person that likes to be surrounded by nature, you want to be, a, you know, a, a city which has a lot of history, maybe like loads of culture, yeah, um, and isn't like materialistic, then <laughs> this is probably not a good place for you. Yeah, yeah, but but you look at Mayfair, right? I mean, we're we're 20 minutes away from Mayfair. We're in Hampstead, which is a very affluent area, and. But a lot of people say, no, London's a little bit too showy. It's like, no, 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 you're coming down to a very affluent, driven place. And it's, yeah. it, 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 it's got a, a high, vibrant energy to it. Mayfair and London and you know and Kensington, it's got a vibration of energy about it. And if you're somebody that wants peace, quiet nature, as you said, then what you need to do is to start listening to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what you've noticed is that Dubai has the energy that's inspiring to you, and it doesn't necessarily be inspiring to everybody else. Exactly. Now, 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 with this, right, um, something I, I kind of really want to um, kind of zone in, zone in on um, your business growth journey, because there's a lot of people that are uh, following the podcast. <laughs> and as the name entails, and I did ask you, did, did message this ahead of it. Um, there's a lot of things that you've done very, very well over the years, your coaching, um, your, your business, your YouTube. Let me just ask you at this point of, of the podcast, what does mastery mean to you mastery for me is when you've just completely like nailed a specific skill i would say whether it be like going to the gym you've just mastered the art of let's say for example if you want to build muscle the art of lifting weights applying tension to a specific mu muscle 
you know, perfecting form and execution, whether it be in business, uh, you know, whether you just mastered the art of being able to, to, to grow a company or to lead people, whatever it might be. I think it's, it's literally, you, you just feel so comfortable, confident, and you just know exactly how it should be done. I love that. I love that. And as I said to people so many times, mastery is always a, a something in progress. You know, you can always continue to get better at something. You and I talked about it in training, you know, that art of execution, there's always things that we can learn. And it's being, I think it's also being open-minded to it as well, that there's more to learn. So w- when it comes to it, you know, you, the mastery, and this is something that we really want to really want to talk about at this point in your life, do you think that you have developed mastery of this life? Because a lot of people are out there and they want this, this ideal life. I'm not trying to build Mike Thurston's life. Mike Thurston's building his own. Anybody out there really watching Mike, it's Mike's life. It's Mike's design. But something that's really passionate for you is building this dream life. Yeah. How close do you think you are at this moment in time to have created the dream life for Mike Thurston? Honestly, I think I, I achieved that that pretty much the moment that I'd moved out to Dubai and, you know, I was just able to step out of my apartment, go to the beach. I was in complete, you know, control of my working hours. Uh, I pretty much had the, the freedom to do whatever it is that I wanted to do. I had financial freedom. I had freedom with my work. And I think at that point in time as well, you know, I was, I was 20, just turned 29 I felt like extremely comfortable with the individual that I had become Mm -hmm. and I think yeah at at that point I was just asking myself okay so where do I go from here and I was asking myself like what okay so what is it that I need to keep doing in order to feel fulfilled and to try and sort of maintain a a level of happiness Mm -hmm. because even though I feel like, yeah, I've, I've mastered quite a lot of areas in my life, there's still a lot that I need to work on. You know, there's, there's, there's relationships, there's some things which, say, for example, you know, I have my own demons, which I'm, I'm working on. I've got my own bad habits. So I'm, I'm, I'm far from being a, a master at life, but I feel like, relatively speaking to a lot of people, I'm ahead of the game. I love that. Because I think I'm, I'm very... I'm very intuitive and I, I just, I understand myself very well. Like I, I know what I want. I know what I don't like. And I know what makes me happy. So I, I know what, great- I know what I, I know what I want. I know what I like when I know what I don't like. I think that's really important as well because people just don't know. They don't question yeah. that. You've been, you've been, you've been pretty stubborn with that, haven't you? Yeah. Like yeah. It literally any point over the past few years, <laughs> I've not enjoyed something or I've not liked something. I'm like, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. I think a lot of people just continue to keep doing things they don't like and, you know, just graft away or just complain about it instead of actually realizing, okay, they really don't like doing this. So how can they change this? You know, certain things which I was doing in the past, you know, I wasn't enjoying, but it was a source of income for me. I was like, okay, well, I don't like doing this anymore. So how can I, you know, figure out a way to make, money doing something that I actually enjoy doing mm-hmm. and then I'll just figure it out and then I'd go and you know put a plan together and execute it on on the way to you you know developing this skill this mastery of your life because you know it's so so obvious you know a lot of people are oh Mike just picked up a camera and put on YouTube what we're, what we're really feeling from this episode of the podcast is you really really are a very very introspective you really look inside Mike a lot don't you yeah, and I, 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 do you know what? I actually didn't know that about you. You you're really inquisitive to your thoughts, aren't you? Yeah, you know, and, and I, 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 it helps. I do. I spend a lot of time by myself, and I'm constantly having conversations with myself and asking myself questions. And I think that's something which I noticed when I'm when I've been living with people in the past. You know, when I used to share a house with housemates, or if I was constantly surrounded by people, my attention is always on those other people, uh, whether I'm, I'm having a conversation with them, uh, we're going out, we're doing something. You know, I would find during those phases of my life, I, I wasn't 
giving myself that time to think, reflect, and ask myself questions. But the moment I moved into my own place, which was the end of 2016, when I went to London, that was the very first time I'd ever lived by myself. Mm -hmm. So the shift was strange because I did feel a bit lonely because I'd, I was always used to being surrounded by people. Mm. But at, at that point, I noticed my career uh, and self-development progressed massively because there was no distractions. It was just me alone with my own thoughts. And I was, you know, free to do whatever it was that I wanted to do. Do you think you were potentially before before you started listening to Mike? You know, one of Mike's signature points of entrepreneurism is to listen to the, yourself and listen. But but before that, when you were living with other people, there was a lot of chaotic noise that potentially wouldn't have given you the opportunity to stop and really challenge what you wanted out of life. So that big take home right now, I think, is is that ability to be present right now and ask lots of questions um, because that certainly shaped a lot of the journey. And then you've listened to what the answers are, right? Yeah. You know, I made a big shift. I'm, I'm really interested to know with that because you talked about um, uh, your own self confidence and that, and 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 uh, you know that journey on your own from moving to London to now being in Dubai. Um, we see a great body. We see a tan guy. We see a lot of guys, you know, doing great things. What what are what are your top two challenges that you faced, which people would be uh, unaware of along your journey? So, so almost every day I, I, I wake up and I'm like, I don't want to be in front of the camera. It's like, it's not naturally something which I want to do. I, I'm not like eager to pick up a camera or to go and be uh, on camera and like be like the center of attention. I would much rather just not do it, keep myself to myself and just you know, maybe just do something on my computer or hide behind my phone and maybe like post something. So before I go on camera, I always do have to kind of, I have to psych myself up a little bit. Really? Particularly now, like when it comes to doing any sort of travel lifestyle videos, you, you have to be uh, a good speaker on the camera. You have to be engaging. You have to provide a certain energy. And I don't always have that energy. There's days when I wake up and I'm just like, I don't want to do this today. But as I psych myself up and I'm just like, bam, okay, Let's go. Let's let's get it done. And I, I do find sometimes in a in a in a group situation, it's quite difficult to kind of still be the center of attention in the video, especially when you're surrounded by a lot of uh, very charismatic, extroverted people who are like they're, they're just loud and they they want the center of attention. Mm -hmm. So I find sometimes that is that is quite difficult. Um. I mean, what else would people be surprised of? I don't know. That's the one that stands out to me the most, I think. Or, or a challenge that you faced in this traveling global world and life that you built for yourself. But one of your biggest challenges, oh, okay, yeah. the, one of your biggest there's, challenges along that journey. I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of negative feedback sometimes because really? you, yeah, you are, you know, you, you really are putting yourself out there. And particularly if you if you want to share more with your audience, you're automatically just going to be judged. And I think it can be, you know, sometimes now I just don't even want to read YouTube comments. But YouTube comments are the worst because people can post anonymously. Yeah. And, you know, there's times when you put, you'd really put a lot of uh, effort uh, and hard work into creating something. And for people just to dismiss it or to send you some abuse, or even just, you know, maybe the, the video which you've worked really hard on just doesn't get, like, the views. Mm -hmm. And you're just thinking, like, hang on a second. Like, wh why are people not really interested in this? And I think that's one of the things which is very off-putting for a lot of people who start off with a, a YouTube career. Like, you know, they kind of expect, like, okay, yeah, the views, I'm going to get the views, I'm going to get the subscribers going up. And, like, the first 10, 20, 30 videos, this might not be any interest at all. And at that point, they just think, oh, what's the point? And then they kind of just stop. I know so many people that have temporarily started a YouTube career and then they've just given it up. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you just have to be, I think I've noticed as well, to be, be extremely consistent. And it can be difficult with, you know, the, the amount of work which I've kind of, you know, 
realized I have to do, you know, to continue to, to put out content on YouTube, all these different platforms. It is very, it's time consuming. You have to always make sure that you're, you're presentable, you look the part. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I do just want to, like this summer, I had quite a lot of time off this summer because it was, it was all getting a little bit overwhelming for me because I, I very much like to just be in the present moment and just, you know, live my life instead of going around and like thinking, oh, okay, well, I'm going to take a picture of this for Instagram. Uh, I'm going to put this on Snapchat. I'm like, okay, I need to like update my vlog. And I was, I was realizing that I was literally living my life for other people and not for myself. Very interesting. And it became like, yeah, it, became, it just became very strange. And, uh, you know, I was just, well, you know, I got to a point where I just didn't really want to share anything with anyone anymore. I just wanted to keep my privacy and just, just do my, my own thing. Mm. But it's, it, you, you do have control as to what you share with people. But um, yeah, I think when I, when I got into this like weird routine of just trying to document like everything I was doing, mm-hmm. it did become like very strange. And that, 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 that's, that's really interesting because clearly you're, you're, you're somebody that loves the control and, you know, there's something I'm picking up really from this episode right now that you're actually, you know, you're very in control. You don't like to give your energy away too much. And, uh, you know, you actually know where you want to get to. And it seems to me that a lot of people, and I, I say this a lot, a lot of people aren't in control. They allow a lot of external things to control them. But you seem to be very in tune with knowing when you need to pull things back in control. When you're spending too much time socializing, you pull yourself back to the mic that is the most productive mic. When you're putting too much video out there, you pull yourself back to the mic that's going to be a successful mic. And it's whilst you, we might think it's a bit of a downside, um, is it something you're aware that you do? I I guess so. I think I'm always just trying to figure out like, what is this perfect balance of spending my time on a few different things throughout my day. I know that if I'm over consumed by one thing or I do too much of one thing, then I I start to not enjoy it. And then I become aware that I'm actually neglecting other areas of my life. And that one of the the things which I learned about the summer, which I've just had that the summer, it was like four months where, I really just kind of, I almost see it as like a mini retirement because I went to Spain. I was like, you know what? I actually don't really care about social media. I don't really care about progressing in my career. I just want to actually just forget about all of that and just enjoy my life and not have to worry. And although that was, it was a good experience and I guess it was kind of something which I felt like I needed. After I'd had time off, I actually really missed doing what I was doing, like, being productive creating videos helping people you know seeing growth and progress because that entire summer i felt as though it was just like stagnation with everything mm-hmm. and, it, and to be honest with you so if you take that much time off social media you actually things start to reverse you actually start to become a little bit irrelevant you may actually start losing followers and subscribers so i think i i definitely realized you need to take a bit of time off every now and then but not the the amount of time off which I had over that period of time. And with that, obviously taking a bit of time off leads me quite nicely into discussing entrepreneurism um, because, you know, when you first did that video of you with your eight-year transformation, it was certainly Mike, fitness Mike, and uh, building a body. Just before we get into entrepreneurism, actually, I talk a lot to fitness professionals about becoming the person that people want to follow, Right. Clearly, that transformation that you did was a eight-year dedication to build a physique. Yeah. And for me specifically, I know that a lot of people that I network with still in the industry will have respect for the fact that I still train and stat- that I, I love my training and love my physique. But how important do you think it is, especially as a fitness professional, especially somebody who's presenting themselves in fitness on YouTube, um, to – make a dedicated effort however long it takes to turn them into the type of person that people would want to follow because have you at any point said i know that i need to be like this to ensure that i am somebody that somebody people want to follow yeah i feel like you know particularly if we were speaking about the fitness thing i felt like okay i I need to work on my physique i need to be presentable because without a doubt People just naturally pay more attention if you're in good shape. Yeah. yeah. That's like, that's a fact. 
And I think it was also the fact that I, I really didn't need to master my craft. I needed to, you know, learn the art of actually coaching someone, how to, you know, coach myself. And just it was the experience which I needed from training all those clients which I trained in the past that gave me the confidence to then be like, okay, I love the part and you know I your stuff. It. Yeah. So yeah. now I can talk about it. And I think, you know, realistically, I, I, I have an advantage over a lot of people because of the way I look. You know, I, I, genetically speaking, I'm like lucky with, you know, my, my proportions, my ability to put on muscle, lose body fat. And I, I look to myself and I'm like, okay, well, this is a strength of mine. So if I look the part, then I need to be on a platform which is very visual. And YouTube is that. You know, let's say, for example, if someone, you know, necessarily wasn't that confident with the way they looked or maybe it wasn't their strength, then maybe there's another platform which is more suited to them. Yeah, very true. Like possibly podcasting. Um, you know, it, it completely depends. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that, you know, you don't have to look amazing to, to, to be on YouTube. You know, there's, there's plenty of people that have grown successful channels just either because they literally put out really good information or they, they put a lot of time into making videos like in terms of like the graphics and the visuals, like very impressive mm. or they're just simply very charismatic and, you know, people actually you know, find them very entertaining uh, or people just like to listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's people it doesn't matter what your strength is. I think you, you, you can figure out what it is that you're good at, capitalize on that. And if maybe, let's say, for example, something that you're not that great at, try and improve it. So maybe work on your physique a little bit. Like with me, work on my confidence because my confidence and speaking skills were absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. So that was something which I worked upon. And then that allowed me to, to be better at presenting myself. Amazing. Now, entrepreneur, Mike, at the moment, if I'm right, you have your thirst app. Yeah. You have your thirst clothing. Clothing. Yeah. Obviously, YouTube is a monetized platform for you. Mm -hmm. um, your sponsorships. Okay. Am I missing anything? No, it's put like affiliate links and other bits, but the, a, a lot promotions of, a lot. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, lots of holidays. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you something pretty interesting. This is. This has literally just happened within the past few days. So the, the potential for the clothing company is absolutely huge. But the problem I've had is um, trying to do too many things at once. Let's say, for example, if my sole focus was to grow my clothing company and 100% of my effort went into that, it would be way further ahead right. than where it is now. In the past, it's kind of been like, to be merchandise, it's like, let's have a bit of fun with it. But now it's like, okay, this is something serious that has a lot of potential. The same thing with the app. The app is an easier thing to plug because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the gym. I'm in shape. I can very easily talk about that within my videos. They want your workout. Sure. But let's say, for example, if, if I just focused on one thing, whether it be the YouTube revenue, the app revenue, or the clothing revenue, it would be way further ahead than where it currently is now. I'm currently in a position now where it's like, okay, so there's a, there's a few different things that I need to manage and try and, you know, uh, maximize as much as possible. And I think the biggest problem I've had is trying to do it all by myself. Yeah, I've uh, realized, okay, if I want to see continued growth with all of these, I need to start hiring people to help me. I need to start creating a team. So with the, with the YouTube or, or anything on social media, I've got to have a cameraman and I've got to have a guy who's going to be able to edit and you know ensure that things are edited for each specific platform. You know, but sometimes one cameraman might not even be enough. I might actually need two people, you know, especially if you're doing stuff for Instagram, YouTube, yeah. TikTok, whatever it might be. So you have the, 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 the content creation team who are helping you out and pretty much taking all that work off your plate. All you have to do is maybe come up with some content ideas and just deliver. Yeah. The, with the app, again, that, that kind of runs itself, but there is like the private Facebook page, which needs a lot of time and attention and, you know, I, I'm, you know, we spoke about hiring an assistant. I want my assistant to ensure that people 
uh, getting the responses and feedback almost immediately because I'm not always there to, to get back to people. And the clothing thing, like this is potentially the area which needs the most uh, assistance because I, you know, I'm not exactly like a fashion guru. Uh, I, I don't know the, you know, how a clothing business operates as well as I should do because, you know, I was started this like maybe two years ago, not having a clue about anything. So I'm trying to do a little bit more research into, you know, how these things work, but it would make much more sense to hire someone who has years of experience 100%. working within uh, uh, retail and how to, how a, a clothing business operates, you know, instead of me trying to learn it, you know, cause that's something I've not mastered. I've not mastered the art of growing a clothing company yeah. and how the fashion industry works. So why don't I just hire someone who has mastered it and then they can, you know, take care of that. But I think this is the whole idea of wealth, Mike. A lot yeah. of people think wealth is just so you can buy cars, watches and uh, live a champagne lifestyle. Um, a large percentage of the tur turnover we make as a company goes on team. Yeah. Because if the vision, if you've said that Thirst is going to be a multi, you know, multi-million pound clothing brand, whatever it needs to be, Richard Branson doesn't fly the planes. Yeah. Right. So I, I think this is a really important lesson for people is that you've been juggling multiple plates, but it's a, a turning point now where the team Thurston's building. Yeah. You know, am I, am I, I right? I think there's so many people who actually are really reluctant to part with their money. Yes. Yeah. You know, even I remember when I was doing everything myself, like the, the filming and the editing, you know, I was just a one man army. And I was, I'd see all the money that was coming in. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Mm. But then I was thinking, oh, like, to film and edit a video, like, it's really time consuming. And the, the prospect of having to, you know, I knew that maybe it would take, like, my whole day would be written off just by creating a video. And I thought, you know what, it's, you know, it's time to actually find someone to help me and actually start paying them. And you know what, like, when you actually, like, when I found a cameraman, when I found an editor, it didn't actually cost me any more anyway, because with their help, it allowed me to actually double my output. Yeah. So I could create twice as many videos. So the revenue that I would earn from the extra videos would pay for the camera for themselves. So I was like, oh. I don't think people yeah. think like that. I, don't, I, I think that <clears throat> this whole thing in entrepreneurism, which is time, is the more time you have, the more you can be creative, the more collaborations you can do. And the more, tr and honesty, you can stay doing the thing that you're most inspired to do because if you're doing the things you're not inspired to do, you're unfulfilled and stressed out, but there's also somebody better than you, as you probably just found out with the clothing, like I do, you know, I've got Sarah, who's a strategist within the company. Um, you know, she's chief ops and marketing and she's actually way better than it than me, even yeah. though I'd, I'd want to do it. And she's literally on at me. Don't do this. You do this. Don't do this. And by taking on these roles and everybody else in their different departments, whether it's director of PT or whatever it is, um, you know, the entrepreneur, Mike, then, um, because we just obviously touched on developing a team. There's a lot of coaches that are very interested in earning more money as their life develops, you know, accumulating wealth. Um, what's been the stepping stone of your value on money over the years and and how is how, how what's your relationship with money now <laughs> it's a good question i think uh during my time as a personal trainer i was always struggling i, I was making ends meet but i was never i never had an abundant amount of uh disposable income and i think the problem with that was you know because i had a studio the studio had overheads anytime there was with cash built up, you know, it would go on to something else, like improving something. So it wasn't until I moved to London, the YouTube took off, the online coaching took off, that I actually had quite a bit of money to spare. And I think it reached a certain monthly revenue whereby I was content. It definitely brought me more happiness. It solved a lot of problems. But at that point, I never really, I find it hard to motivate myself to make more money because I realized, let's say, for example, if I was earning like 70 to 100,000 pound a month, right? To, to earn an extra 100,000 pound, an extra 200,000 pound on top of that, it doesn't really improve your life 
by that much more. So I think the problem I've always had is that I'm not necessarily motivated by the numbers. I'm yeah. not motivated by the money. I'm actually more motivated by the satisfaction I get from what it is that I'm doing. You know, there's, there's a lot of things which I do. I do it because it makes me happy. I don't do it because it makes me money. If I was motivated by money, I would be doing a lot of other things which would, you know, I'd be 10 times wealthier than I am today, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily what I'm motivated by, which I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm trying to shift it a bit because I want to be more, uh, you know, focused on the numbers because if I've, you know, if I'm generating more money, then that means I can grow my businesses further. But that's, you know, honestly, that's what my, my view on money has been. Mm -hmm. Once you reach a certain level of income, you know, it's getting more on top of that doesn't provide you with that much more value. And, and, it, and is there a shift now in uh, kind of at, at this point right now, you say that there's a, there's an aspect of you that's starting to want to shift that. Are you becoming more uh, inspired? Cause here's the interesting thing. I, I, my question was, are you becoming more inspired by money? But before I get there to kind of younger aspiring fitness professionals, I've always said this might be great at your craft and do what you love because the end result will be wealth. Yeah. Yeah, normally is a something that people avoid that very early, very quickly, very early. They're like, I want to make a lot of money, but you became great at your craft, developing your physique, developing a brand. How is Mike Thurston now with you? Know, you said you're trying to become better at that. How how is your view of money started to shift, and and what do you feel that you would would be more inspired by in terms of not necessarily in a figure of growth, but how do you see placing more attention on money now being and figures bringing more value to the journey uh, that you want to go on? Yeah, I think what I'm definitely, whereas before it was a very uh, selfish approach and I was, I, I would always think about money and what could I do with the money? Whereas now I think about, okay, so, this money is not for me. The, the additional money which the, you know, the, the revenue streams are providing, I'm thinking about, okay, so how can I use this to help progress my existing businesses further? And I think particularly when it comes to like the, the clothing company, which was, it was a, a bit of an eye-opener for me, it's just how much money you need to pump into something like that, like to, to get the you know, stock is not cheap. You know, if you're getting different sizes, if you're getting different colors of particular models, you know, I remember my, the first few invoices I was getting, I was like, oh, like that money could have been mine for me to enjoy personally. But instead, it was something which I was, you know, investing yeah. into something else, which it's it's a risk. But I have I have belief that it's, it's, it's going to pay off. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why. You know, I, I have had so many different clothing brands in the past approach me, you know, wanted to work together that would have paid very good money, you know, companies like Gymshark, BQ, whatever it might be. But I always saw that as a very... They, they were on the table, weren't they? Oh, yeah, they were, they were yeah, on the table. Yeah, I remember. All, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They were offering pretty lucrative, you know, figures. But I, I always saw that as just it's a very temporary thing. Like, yeah, it's good money, but it's short term and eventually it's going to end. And then what do you have at the end of that? Nothing really. Who's that's really great, benefiting? Mate, that's, a, that's a massive way of thinking it. You've got a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of influencers right now not thinking of the long-term game because I've noticed this, Mike. There's a lot of people being sponsored by companies. They're seeing that short-term win, but there's no brand at the end of it for them, right? Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, you're, you're very disposable. In such a competitive market, like you could, maybe you do something in one of your YouTube videos with it, which they don't like. Maybe, you know, you just start to become irrelevant. Nobody really watches your videos anymore. Uh, and th these companies will notice, well, your reach has kind of disappeared. So, you know, we don't want to work with you anymore. Maybe you're not cool anymore. Maybe you don't have that physique. Like, you know, a lot of these influencers, when they're working with these clothing companies, you know, when you get to the age of like 35, you know, you kind of come in towards the end of your, your career with them. They're looking at like the younger generation uh to to model their clothes and like i said at the end of that who's really benefit benefited well the the clothing company has because you've helped to uh grow their exposure and their brand and you they, they may sell it right they may sell it yeah and you have you know 
maybe if you've saved the money and you've invested it wisely, okay, maybe it was worth it. But most of the time, you know, most people come out with nothing. And that's something which I, I always kind of feared. Like I thought, you know what, well, you know, in the next five years, let me try and grow my own company. Like there's, there, re there really will be minimal payoffs. Um, you know, everything which that company earns, I'm going to have to put back into it. I'm probably going to have to put more of my own money into it. But I'm hoping that at the end, there is going to be something there. And it's just, it's way more satisfying to see something which you've created to and build, and build it yourself. Yeah. And yeah. to just, you know, to like wear your, your own clothes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, that's the way I've, I've seen it. And it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's definitely not necessarily for everyone, um, you know, clothing, but maybe there is something else which you can create of your own, you know, maybe it could be, you know, maybe you want to do like a drinks product or maybe you want to do a supplement or maybe it's an accessory or whatever it might be. If you come up with a, an idea, you know, maybe put a bit of money behind it and just see what happens, you know, that may be the thing, which is that's going to, it could be the biggest payoff for you. The reality of this, right, is that Mike Thurston has spent um, 12 years now, 31, mm -hmm. since yeah. you kind of started that 18-year-old body transformation you did to yourself before you started a clothing range, um, before you hit the 1 million mark on YouTube. Um, and it, it's quite interesting, right? There's a book by Matthew Side called Bounce, and he talks about um, 10 years of expertise, um, do you really think right now is, is um, you know, you've done that 10 to 12 years of, of finding you, finding your purpose, finding your why, finding who you truly are. And now do you feel like things are, 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 are like, a, like a rocket's just take, taken off? Do you feel like, I find this fascinating when I talk to entrepreneurs is that they have that 10 years of, you know, they want to grow, then it's a big wobbly phase where they're trying to get there and then they get there. And of course, you're going to have these new challenges. But I find this fascinating because you're yet another person that's got to 10 to 12 years in their career. And now things are taking off, but you've had that big journey to get here. Do you feel that that, that there's like a bubble building right now that yeah. something's about to take off? Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think it partly had something to do with the summer I just had. And then in combination with how old I am, you know, when I turned 31, I was like, okay, so am I where I want to be right now? Am I happy with where I am at the age of 31? And I realistically, I was like, well, no, probably not. I, I, I thought I would actually be further ahead. Yeah. Um, and I, I just thought, okay, so what, where do I want to be when I'm 33, 34, 35? What do I want to have at that point in time? And then I realized, okay, if I want to get there, like I'm, I'm seriously going to have to like step my game up and maybe even just, okay, maybe I'll pull back on how much time I'm spending on doing, you know, these things and focus my attention more on doing these other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really have a fear of being, you know, older and just thinking damn like i actually wasted quite a lot of my potential mm -hmm. I, like, I, 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 go on yeah. sorry yeah i was just thinking i could i could i could be way further ahead than where i am right now but i i, I didn't capitalize on the opportunity which i had and you know me be, me be, being based in dubai having the network which i have which is continuously growing having the platforms which i have like the sky is literally the limit for me yeah, yeah, and i yeah. think the most overwhelming thing i have at the moment is thinking okay so what am i going to do with it what do i do with this what, what do i focus my attention on like i i could you know, set up a number of different companies if i wanted to i could if i wanted to i could start doing a supplement line maybe i could do my own brand of coffee you know maybe i could come up with an idea for starting like a new app you know i, I have all these ideas in my head and I just need to think, okay, so which one is, has more likelihood of actually working? And which one am, am I going to get more satisfaction from actually spending a lot of my time and attention doing? And also not make the mistake of trying to do too many things and then neglecting, you know, some of the things which are actually working for me very well right now. I don't think a lot of people appreciate this. Um, great friend of mine, you know, JP, um, you know, Jordan extended his brand once he'd built his reputation to supplements, to, to, to doing what he's doing uh, and his clothing. You built the brand, built Mike Thurston as a personal brand. And now you've got that ability to extend it into different lines. 
And there's a lot of people who get 500, 600 followers on YouTube and suddenly want to start their own t-shirts and put all their effort into their t-shirts. Can I ask you then at this point, um, and uh, what, what, what are some big tips? Let, let's say, I don't want to put like five, 10 or everything like this. What would be your top two tips to any aspiring young entrepreneurial coach, whether or not they wanted to start a YouTube channel, Instagram page, whatever, what would be your two top personal brand tips? Because you've been around a long time. Now you've got the opportunity to create your own, your own extended sub, you know, clothing range and everything like that. What would be your top big, biggest tips for personal brand growth? Um, personal brand growth, definitely don't, don't promote too many other brands. I see this with uh, a lot of influencers. They, they literally say yes to every single opportunity and they're constantly promoting a different brand every single day. Yeah. And it just kind of dilutes you know, what they're actually about. It's like they're just a walking billboard. You don't really know you know, who they are, what they stand for. They're literally just a walking advertisement for endless brands. And particularly if some of the brands are a bit like, you know, like, what, why are you promoting this brand? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with your core values. It doesn't necessarily make you look good. Like, if anything, you've just devalued yourself by working with this brand. Yeah, you made a bit of money, but, you know, you've tarnished your brand by doing that. Um, so I, I would definitely say be very picky. Be picky with who you work with and almost try and work with brands that that actually make you look good, that can also almost help to, to elevate, you know, your brand itself. So I've said no to so, so many different opportunities just because I'm like, no, that's, it doesn't look good, Mike Thurston being associated with this. Yeah. You know, if, I, if I'm trying to pre- present my brand as being something which is like, stylish elegant classy like top tier you know more high end then i'm not going to necessarily work with the the sort of the the lower end brands as it were um and then i guess you just have to be very consistent with just being you what you stand for um i I think one of the i don't know if i had to ask myself what I've been good at. I guess if, if people have been watching my videos over the years, I, I, I've, I've not really changed a whole lot. I mean, obviously I've grown, I've matured, I've become wiser, but the things which I stand for still remain the same. I saw like, that, I, you know, I went down five years back and, 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 and you, it's very constant. Yeah. You've, you've got I, better, better at your videos and better at talking, right? Yeah. But your values I, are still very aligned. My, my values on, you know, my training, life outside of the gym uh you know enjoying life traveling and you know just trying to give off a good vibe a good message and just being honest with people Mm -hmm. and you know being i guess people may like me because because i'm a i'm a likable guy i I don't know what it is i don't know why people are there's people who have watched my videos why they continue to watch my videos but I guess whatever it is that I'm doing seems to be working. But so therefore, think- it's clearly consistency because if it's consistency, yeah. people know that they're going to get the same mic every time as opposed to some guy that a year down the line tries to be a clown and then next year tries to be crazy. They're just watching them displaying more lack of consistency and lack of clarity with their values, but they've seen you be very, very clear and uh, it's very, very evident with the rapid growth of the, the brand, obviously, with yourself. Yeah. Um no, obviously, the, people. The, go on. the thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm actually. This has kind of happened, you know, subconsciously without me actually thinking about it. Like this, this it was never really a strategy, you know, me trying to uh, brand myself as a certain way, particularly to begin with. That's just literally who I was. And but I, you've you've so, stayed true to who Mike is. I think that's the yeah. most important thing. And most people say, "Oh, I've got to create a brand." First thing, who are you? And I think you have, you've actually known who you are, which is very, very powerful. Yeah. You know, and and I've seen that. And and it's one of the reasons, uh, if I'm honest, there's a lot of opportunities to speak for me to speak to a lot of influencers, but you know, um, your knowledge, you know, since the day I first met you, you've been the same guy, just watching you grow a lot of respect for your entrepreneurism and, and the brand that you built. And, um, you know, 
I don't say that for every influencer out there, in, in my opinion. So the, that speaks a lot for for some for what you've just said. Now it wouldn't be right without me asking you this question. And this is we've got one more question after this, which is a shorter question. But uh, I said this in a message to you: top five tips. But like, give me your. And I know a lot of people are going to say, "When's he going to ask him this question?" You've built a very successful YouTube channel. What yeah. are your top two tips that you could give any aspiring young uh, fitness professional who's trying to build a YouTube channel? Uh, first one is the consistency. Yep. You have to be relentlessly consistent. Even when things are not working out, like maybe you know, you're not getting the views, you're not getting the subscribers you'd hope for, you definitely have to be consistent with just keep putting the content out, but maybe you do have to change up what it is that you're putting out there. Maybe you have to refine something, refine the presentation, improve the quality of the content, whatever it might be. But you just have to keep putting the, the content out there. You're not going to blow up overnight or just from making five videos, unless you're already a very established, famous person. If you're a nobody, you know, you've just got to keep grinding it out. And it's, you know, it's going to suck because there are days when you're just going to be like, what is the point of me doing this? Yeah. Uh, and I guess that kind of brings me on to uh, my next point is you have to genuinely want to do it and get some satisfaction from doing it. Uh, I know that the process of actually making a video sometimes isn't the most enjoyable thing for me, but the most satisfying thing for me is to actually see it go live, to see it go out there and to know that I've, I've, I've created a video from nothing. I, I find it, incredibly satisfying to just put uh, a piece of content out there whether it be informative motivational or uh, you know entertaining to see other people watch it and to actually you know to get the positive feedback that is that almost keeps me going like particularly when I'm walking about on the streets whatever if, when people say you know you changed my life or you're the reason I came to Dubai you're the reason why I quit my job you're the reason why I lost 20 kilograms that is you're the, reason no. I, you're the reason why I party so hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess that really, that's not part of the, uh, the question. I guess as well, um, I think you, you don't have to be on YouTube. You know, you, there, there are a number of different platforms out there and you may find that one of them is the one for you. Like, I know some people who have like, they're actually blown up on TikTok and if that's working, then do the TikTok. You know, if podcasting thing is okay, do do the podcasting. You, I would say, pick, pick, pick one or two, and then just see which one is working best for you. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a massive, massive piece of advice. Now, my final question to you, and this is what the whole episode really is about. You know, I asked you this earlier on in the podcast um, about building your dream life. And you were very honest and said that I think right now I have that, but I'm continuing mastering it and continuing to grow it. What would be your number one piece of advice that you've picked up along the way that's helped you to build your dream life? Just constantly having a conversation with yourself and asking yourself, are you at do you like doing this? What do you like doing? What do you not like doing? And all the things that you like doing, maybe continue doing more of those things, the things that you, you don't enjoy doing. You know, sometimes at the end of the day, there are things you're going to have to do that you don't enjoy, but try and eliminate those things which you don't enjoy doing. And then if you actually figure out that you're spending most of your day enjoying the things you do, then you're obviously going to be pretty damn happy with the life that you're living. Why would you not be? I love that. I think, do you know what? I've known you for quite a while now. Um, and the one thing I'm taking away from this is how much you question where you want to be. And it's no surprise that you're not only incredibly successful with your social media and your personal brand, but you're incredibly successful in yourself. Now the end result of constant challenging equals a happy mic. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that if we can take anything away from this is that if you don't challenge yourself, you don't really have an opportunity to get to this destination of thing that you think you want to get to. Um, and you're the product of challenge, right? Yeah. Wow. Exactly. Very powerful. And, um, I know guys, um, this is, uh, an episode, which 
I think on the outside, I'm sure you'll agree with me, Mike. People will say, you know, Mike Durston, the YouTuber. I wanted this episode to be Mike Durston, the entrepreneur and the guy that's created a dream life. And everything has not just been a, a YouTube video and a load of money and living in Dubai. Well, do you know what it is? I, I think a lot of people don't actually know this side of me. Yeah, exactly. Mike. Uh, and exactly. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people who will come across me, they, they come across the Instagram, they come across the YouTube. The Instagram... It's, it's, it's a high, highlight reel of some of the things I've done, the places I've gone. And so many people automatically make an assumption of what type of personality I have. And the majority of the time I meet someone for the very first time, they're pleasantly surprised because there's more to me than a guy prancing about the beach wearing short shorts. Yeah, yeah. Then with the YouTube channel, you definitely get to know, you get to know me more, particularly if you followed me over the years. But again, it's like a lot of it isn't, the real me that's like that's the Mike the presenter Mike the you know the, the entertainer just trying to you know keep you guys engaged and uh, you know show you something which is pretty cool or interesting or whatever it might be mm. it's one of the reasons why I want to get into doing you know uh, podcasting because I feel like a platform like this I actually have an opportunity to to talk more about you know interesting topics like this and then people are like oh okay like this, this is the actual, like Mike Durston, he's, you know, he's, he's not trying to like impress or do anything flashy or fancy. It's just, this is just who I am. Yeah. It's just giving people a different perspective. When I was bodybuilding, um, I literally just had me muscle tan lifting heavy weights. And when I started podcasting, and I think you and I spoke about this in Dubai, uh, when I started podcasting and also demonstrating part of my life with my wife and, and what I do, they were like, Oh, he's not just a meathead. And it's like, I've, I've been very, structured in the route towards building the life that I've got right now. And you've been very structured in building what you're building, but no one really knows about the businessman behind here, the personal, the, the, the person behind here, the challenges that you've had. And that goes back to kind of like, you know, it may not be perfect for the YouTube channel, but the YouTube channel at the end of the day is a vehicle to build a life and a, and a business for you and, and to help other people along the way. So the fact that we've had this episode and the fact that I've had the, the privilege, Mike, to, to be able to interview you today and get out of you a lot of things, a lot of gems and a lot of things that a lot of people won't know about you, but also a real, real um, understanding of the journey of an entrepreneurial YouTuber and, 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 and business person and fitness model, um, a side that a lot of people didn't really know. And I, I really know without a doubt that this would have provided huge value and, and a lot of um, a lot for everybody on it. So thank you. Um, now, just so that everybody can find you, your YouTube channel, your Instagram, what's the best way to get hold of you and uh, get involved in your world? Just if you search for Mike Thurston, most of my stuff is going to pop up without a doubt. Um, and then obviously the clothing, if you just type in Thurst, T-H-R-S-T, uh, you'll obviously get linked to the Instagram page and uh, the website. So and a very smart new range, by the way. Very smart. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, it's it's getting better and better. That's the thing. I, I see the potential. I'm like, oh, and especially because a lot of the, the northern hemisphere going into colder climates now, people <laughs> people can't be wearing swim shorts. So I did, I did laugh. I did laugh when you had the the hoodie in Dubai. Yeah, That's 40, <laughs> 40 plus degrees. <laughs> I, I remember I did that shoot in in May, and like I was literally. Oh. Like, drenched on the inside and i thought like this shoot is going to be a complete disaster because like look at the state of me but it actually it came out pretty it worked, well it worked oh well well listen um I, I really appreciate your time mike and i nearly well actually i nearly got the time wrong because we've our clocks have changed in the uk so i really really do appreciate your time mike and uh I will direct everybody to you so they can start following your journey and just just understand, you know, there's a lot more to um, to a lot of people out there than uh, you you first assume. So I thank you so much for your time, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.